Welcome to the Voice of Triumph with Roger R. Woodard, Senior Pastor of Family Worship Center located in Kings Mountain, North Carolina. Pastor Woodard's ministry is reaching a hurting world with the life-changing message of Jesus Christ. Now, from Kings Mountain, North Carolina, here is Pastor Roger R. Woodard. I began the, the year with the, uh, speaking of reading the times, talking about the sons of Issachar who understood the times, knew what Israel should do. And Jesus said in Matthew 16, 3, rebuking the Pharisees and scribes, you can discern this, the sky, but can you not discern the signs of the times? Then Paul wrote, in Romans, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The prophet Hosea says, in Hosea 10, 12, sow to yourselves in righteousness, Reap in mercy. Break up your fallow ground. For it is time to seek the Lord till He come and rain righteousness upon you. What time is it? Well, it's time to seek the Lord. It's an interesting word, seek. Scripture tells us that Satan walks about seeking someone he can devour. Peter says he is as a roaring lion. This will mean something to Dwayne. You remember Durrell? Yeah. Durrell was preaching out in Torrance, and he, he quoted this. And of course, he had a little bit of a speech impediment. He's from Utila, Honduras. And he said, uh, but... He's not the lion. He said, I know who the lion is. <laughs> I'll never forget that. I know who the lion is. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah. The devil is pretending to be the lion. He walks around as a lion. And he'll eat you up if you let him. He's seeking someone that he can eat up. But I read in John 4, 24, where our God is also a seeker. And he's seeking people who will worship him in spirit and in truth. And that's the group we need to be a part of because as we seek the Lord, he's seeking us. Interesting word, as I said, this word seek, it has a multiplied amount of, of meanings. It says to seek, to worship, and even in parentheses it says in a bad sense to plot against. So our God is seeking us, but the devil is seeking too. And he's the bad sense that he's plotting against us in our search for God to be about, to go, to desire, to endeavor, to inquire, to require, to seek after. There were some Greeks who came searching for Jesus and he came, they came to the disciples and they said, Sir, we would see Jesus. I read what the Bible says about Zacchaeus, and I, I love how it references him. It, it says he wanted to see Jesus, who he was. He wasn't content to hear about him. He wasn't content just to take the rumors. I want to know him, and I want to know the real him. And that's what I want today. I want this for all of us, to want to seek after him that we might know him. As Paul said, I want to know him in life here, in the abundant life that he gives here, and then I intend to know him in the power of his resurrection. And this is time for us as a people, for you and me as individuals, but as us a body collectively to seek after the Lord. 
We need to get serious about this in our time. Isaiah 55, verse 1, verse 6 says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Now, you know what that implies? It implies there will come a time when you can't find him. Jesus told of those who just couldn't wait to kill him and get him out of the way. The time's going to come. You're going to seek for me, and you're not going to find me. Every person in this room today, you're here because you have some kind of mental acquiescence of the lordship of Christ and the value of corporate worship for the most part, unless you've been drugged in here by a parent or something. You're here because somewhere deep down you believe Jesus Christ is who he claims to be. And you probably feel like one day you're going to get on fire. I guess you do. Maybe you don't. Maybe you feel like you could just complacently, nonchalantly go through life and please the Lord that way. But it cannot be done. When Paul was witnessing to the king, the king felt Holy Ghost conviction. And he said, Paul, almost you persuade me to be a Christian, but almost don't cut it. And we never find a place where he actually did give his heart to Christ. He said, there are a lot of people who come into the power and presence of the conviction of God, and they tremble, their knees will shake, and their nerves will rattle, but that doesn't mean they're in, you see. You'll have to act upon that conviction, and you'll have to seek after God. And there are a lot of people who have had a red-hot, on-fire walk with God that don't have it now. They still have memories, and they still represent themselves as Christian, but they're not enjoying the abundant life that Jesus purchased for them. So what do we seek when we seek after Him? It's time. Let me tell you why it's time. I don't feel a lot of it acceptance about what I'm preaching, it's okay. Hey, homie going to preach it. I ain't going to try to preach it. I'm going to preach it. And you can receive it or say, well, mm, not his best. Here's the thing. Our times demand a church that is seeking hard after the kingdom of God. And the church can't be that church without individuals who are seeking hard after God. So what are we as a people to seek? We are told of our Lord to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. That's our first priority. He doesn't tell us to to seek health. He doesn't tell us to seek wealth. He doesn't tell us to seek the comforts of this world. He said, get your priorities in order and seek the kingdom of God first and foremost in your life. Seek after the kingdom. Well, what? is the kingdom. Romans 14, 17 tells us what the kingdom is. It's righteousness, the right rule of God in my life, where the Lord Jesus Christ is enthroned on my heart. And I make godly choices because I am sold out to him and for his purpose. I want to be ruled by the righteousness of God. Why? Because if we've got our head on right, we are working in this life to stand in his presence with the knowledge that we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And if we want to hear anything, we want to hear well done, good and faithful servant. We do not want to hear, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. We're going to have to get our priorities on to where, listen, it doesn't matter to me how much flesh is bucking against what I'm saying. You're going to have to get focused that your purpose of living is to do the will of God. Because this life is fleeting. It passes so fast. As I was speaking over our, our, our brother Butch, and I actually was felt led of the Lord to actually use a message that I had preached uh, before the year was out, I believe it was. 
And I was preaching about the psalmist at Psalm 89. Remember how short my time is. In Psalm 90, teach me to number my days. I might apply myself to wisdom to understand that our life here, no matter how long, is a flash. My memory of my youth is a blur. And here we are on the brink of eternity. And I know it's hard when you're young to acknowledge this. I mean, mentally you can acknowledge it, but you, it's hard to grasp it. That this life is a flash. We want to get it right. Why? Because this is not our home. We've been called to a higher plane. We've been given the privilege to come before the throne of God and bring our needs. Every time we need mercy, every time we have a problem, we have been given the privilege of prayer to come into the presence, not of the president, of a prime minister, of a governor or a mayor. We've been given the privilege to come into the presence of the one who said, let there be and there was, and the one who keeps it all in his hand tonight. You may not have wealth. You may not be famous. You might not have any what the folks in Chicago call clout, but the King of kings and the Lord of lords knows you by name and you can come to his throne every time you have a need. What a privilege we've been given. And he wants us to seek his kingdom first. In us. In us. Peter and John going up to the temple at the time of prayer and a lame man is sitting there. He's wanting money. They didn't have any to give him. They looked down at him and said, look on us. The Bible says in King James, and I love it, he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. He had an expectation of receiving something. He, what? he didn't know what he was about to get. Peter says, silver and gold, I don't have any money to give you, sir. And if I did give you money, you'd be here tomorrow asking for more. But I do have something to give you, and you won't be a lame man after it comes into your life, and you won't be here begging anymore. I've got something to give you that won't leave you like I found you. But here, here's the key. You have to have it to give it. We have a lame world. We have a needy world. They need what we're preaching and what we testify about. But we have to have the victory if we're going to impart the victory. We need more than a sermon. We need more than a Sunday school lesson. We need more than a theory or a doctrine. We need the reality of the kingdom of God in our life. So we can impart it unto others. What do we seek? Kingdom of God and His righteousness. Here, peace. How many people in the world would give a fortune for peace? To get off tranquilizers and all kind of mood-altering drugs because you can't sleep at night. You can't rest at night. They're tormented. What would they give for real peace? Not temporary numbing. Real peace. It's only found in Jesus Christ. It's a peace that passes all understanding. It's joy unspeakable and full of glory. And you said, my experience is not like that. I'm telling you how you fix it. Someone help that young man find a seat. I tell you how you fix it. You seek the kingdom of God first. Do I have to wait till he gets to a seat? Now that should not be, parents. I'm sorry to embarrass you, but that's an embarrassment to me. We need to understand. We can't have peace if we're double-minded. We have to have our focus. Christ number one. He won't take second place. He'll just leave us and go on to someone else. 
Leave us to our own devices. And we can't survive that way. We may exist for a while. We seek the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And the kingdom is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. And if you're not enjoying your walk with God and you don't have joy, you're not seeking the kingdom. You say, oh, brother, well, that's just not true. Listen, let God be true and every man a liar. But if you're going to have these things, you have to seek these things. You have to get your heart fixed to come hard after God. The times we're living in demand a New Testament church full of New Testament Christians. And I just might as well relax and preach this because we're where we are. I think I've got more ice out inside maybe than outside. I don't know. No church can be a New Testament church. Hear me well. No church can be a true New Testament church unless that church has all nine gifts of the Spirit all nine fruit of the Spirit and signs and wonders taking place in their midst. What are you saying that I'm saying we're not a New Testament church? Oh, I know the name says Church of God. You go a lot of places where the label on the door doesn't match the reality of the house. Because we've reached a time where you can't really judge a congregation by their label even of their doctrine. You judge them by their practice. My children went to a number, I, I called the name of the place in the Wednesday night Bible study. I won't do it here because this is going to Europe and different places, but uh, a, a very nominal structured denomination. And when they enrolled, I talked with the practice principal they were very respectful of us very kind to me and my kids well some of the staff were not but most of the staff were <coughs> excuse me and so I told the uh, the headmaster if I know their doctrinal differences and, and but if they come up I'll deal with them at home they won't be a, an issue in the school and when I looked at their doctrine I had almost no quarrel with it their doctrine was great the problem was their practice. The way they lived and the way they practiced had no relationship virtually to the doctrine. I fear that's where so many Pentecostals are. They'll argue with you about Pentecost, but they don't have the fullness of Pentecost. Why argue with your neighbor that they need the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues if you don't have the experience? Why argue with your neighbor that the, they need peace and they need joy that Jesus gives and you don't have peace and joy? And when the nominal churches have a better moral code than we Pentecostals do, the indictment is on us, not our Savior. Getting quieter by the minute. Well, what do you do about it? Well, railing against it isn't going to change anything. We need to get hungry. Now, having raised two daughters, one of whom is over here, and I've got six wonderful grandkids, you don't feed them if they ain't hungry. They won't open their mouth. Then you try to give them something, they go in the nose, they go in the ear, It'll go all down their clothes and into the floor. But you don't get it in them till they're hungry. Some of you know what I'm talking about. And you don't get the, the fullness of the Lord in people if they aren't hungry. And you could fake a lot of things, but you can't fake hunger, spiritual hunger. You can learn all the hand motions and all the uh, gyrectic things that go with Pentecost 
Because we have up-tempo music, we clap our hands and we wave banners and blow shofars and, and do all these wonderful participatory worship, which I love. But that doesn't mean we're hungry. And if we are going to thrive, maybe even if we survive, but if we're going to thrive, listen, I was just praying in my prayer time this week, and, and here's the thing about it. People think I'm bold, and sometimes I am, and I could be abrasive, that's for, for sure. Certainly uncompromising with the message. But here's one thing that you don't know and that I don't know yet. We don't know the pressure that is coming against the church before the Lord comes. We know that in other places of the world, Christians are dying, being beheaded and crucified for their faith. Churches are being burned. And in the land of the Bible where it all began, they're trying their best to eradicate Christianity. That same element is taking control in the United States of America. You may not believe it, but they are at work and they want to silence us. First, they want to put us in the church and then they'll come for us in the church. But this is a time where we read scripture. The gates of hell shall not prevail. And that doesn't mean the church circles the wagons and becomes defensive. It means we come out armed with the word of God and the power of the Holy Ghost and we take the battle to hell to understand that we are more than conquerors. We're called to be overcomers. We are not called to be the punching bag of the devil and the liberals and anything else. It is time for the church to be the church and take our rightful place in the world. And the only way we're going to do that if we're hungry for God and the power of the Lord God, the gifts of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, signs and wonders, that what Calvary purchased for us in the shed blood of Jesus Christ. He called it abundant life. We need to seek that. The promise from Joel to Pentecost, picked up and preached by Peter on the day of Pentecost. Your sons and daughters shall, not should, not ought to, shall prophesy. Here is what the Word of God tells us. As I said, it requires the gift, the fruit, and signs and wonders. And you have to accept the mandate. I said, you. I don't normally try to do that. I usually always say we. And I'm not excluding me from this challenge. But I said, you. You have to accept the mandate to help bring this about. Pastor can't do it. I have to be involved. But if we become the church God's called us to be, instead of just settling on our laurels and be thankful for what we have, if we become the church that we've got to be, you have to get hungry. 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 You have to come to the house of God with the fire of the Holy Ghost in your bosom. You have to bring a stick of wood to put on the fire. You can't just always warm by someone else's. You can't always just wait till somebody's cup runs over. You need to come with a full cup yourself. And as long as you're content not to, it ain't happening in your life. It ain't happening. And I, I'm sorry if that's too strong of an indictment for you. Here's what the Word of God tells us. 1 Corinthians 14, 12, that we should seek. Seek. To edify the body and not ourselves. This is not about us. It's not about you having warm and fuzzies and a Holy Ghost time all by yourself. The gifts are given to the church for edification. And if we will put ourselves at the disposal of the Lord, we can be the vehicle. Look, when I grew up in the early churches, if someone gave a message in tongues, it was a matter of awe. 
people had somehow gotten the idea that the one with the gift had to be there. Or if it was interpreted, the one with the gift had to be there. If there was a healing, the one with the gift had to be there. Or it wouldn't happen. No concept of what the Word tells us. The gifts are given to the church for the edification of the body. To be an instrument of edification is a high and holy honor which should produce humility. When I begin to sense the Lord is wanting me to give a message in tongues or to give an interpretation, I begin to humble down and pray. And I begin to also question me to make sure it's not coming out of my spirit, but the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to talk to God and I say, God, it's an honor that you would use me and I want to be used of you, but I, I don't want to presume. Dear one, don't you know God is more than capable of giving you peace without ambiguity for what He wants you to do in the Spirit? I'm talking about our calling. I'm talking about our mandate. I'm talking about what God wants from this pastor and this congregation. I'm talking about what God wants from you. He wants to be and me be filled. What is filled? It won't hold no more. Filled with the Holy Ghost and fire to where the devil screams, oh no, they're up. I'm not trying to make us anything we're not. We sang the song a while ago. I am what you say I am. Well, what does he say we are? A born again, spirit filled, blood bought, Holy Ghost child of the living God who's been given authority over all the power of the devil, the power to lay hands on the sick, to cast out devil. Mm, speak with your tongue. Ooh. If I ain't nailed it by now, I ain't getting there. And as long as we're content to not have it, we'll not have it. Thank you for joining us today for Voice of Triumph. We invite you to check out our website at www.familyworship.org. There you will find information on our church service times, special events, purchase our books and music, and also information on becoming a partner as we continue to take the life-changing message of Jesus Christ to a hurting world. If you'd like to write us concerning our program, our address is The Voice of Triumph, P.O. Box 396, Kings Mountain, 28086, USA. On behalf of Pastor Woodard and the entire Family Worship Center team, God bless you and we'll see you next week.